Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Rory Finnan of the Department of Slavonic Studies and Ukrainian Studies program at the University of Cambridge. Uh, I'm here with uh, my colleague Sander van der Linden, director of the Social Decision Making Laboratory here at the University of Cambridge. We're convening a working group on disinformation and media literacy at the university, and we're joined by a veritable dream team of uh, scholars and practitioners. Um, we're here with uh, John Rosenbeek, who's Google Jigsaw postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Psychology, uh, Melissa Bossel, who's uh, a Cambridge Gate scholar in the Department of Psychology, and our excellent partners, Ruud Oosterwood and Rivka Oten of the Dutch team, Droog. Nice to see you all. Um, we'll get started, and I thought um, we might begin um, with setting out our objectives here. So we just want to talk informally about uh, disinformation and how we can uh, confront its, its growth and influence in our everyday lives. Um, we're going to compare disinformation to a virus, something that we're all too attentive to these days, um, and see what so-called inoculation theory has to teach us, looking at examples of, of Cambridge research and we're going to take something of an unconventional approach, I think, and talk also about how disinformation seduces us. So how it uh, gratifies us, entertains us, and about how we can turn this logic of seduction uh, against itself uh, through games and through humor in particular. Um, but first I thought we could quickly define our terms. Um, when we use this term disinformation, we mean intentional falsehoods circulating as news or um, alerts, announcements that are achieving a certain political or, uh, or economic goal. And obviously chaos and confusion can in fact satisfy political and economic goals. Um, we, we don't mean propaganda because propaganda doesn't necessarily have that um, um, intention to deceive uh, in the same way that the term disinformation does. So first off, disinformation is, is not new at all. Um, but certainly in the moment we're living through, in the midst of this pandemic, um, with a U.S. presidential election um, approaching two weeks away, it, at least to me, feels very new, um, or at least feels fresh and different in its strength and potency. Um, and I think we don't often dwell on this point um, nearly often enough, but we are living through a, a kind of revolution in human knowledge with implications for cognition that we don't fully understand, with implications for behavior that we don't fully understand. Um, in some respects, we're venturing into worlds not only of Orwell and Huxley, but also Borges and Calvino, that is, worlds in which information is always available in any language, um, at high speeds, uh, circulating in our news feeds, um, in television tickers, um, and we need to face up, I think, first of all, to this fact that we're often besieged and exhausted by all this information. Um, and when we are besieged and exhausted, we tend to look around for intellectual footholds, intellectual handles, which often, if we're not careful, lead us to um, retreating to our simplest understandings of the world, let's say. Um, we tend to confirm our, our biases rather than exercising muscles of reason. And this is really where disinformation emerges and, and thrives. On top of it, we also have corporations that are structuring our access to all this information and knowledge in a specific way with proprietary algorithms um, that are based not on principles um, or, or not, that don't value at least uh, principles of um, structures of knowledge, but rather on links between uh, sites, uh, uh, networks and people um, and texts. So these, these connections, these links are then harvested, as we know, uh, for profit as well. So um, how do we fight back? How do we contend with the problem that um, cuts very deep, runs very wide? Today we'll be discussing a few tools and strategies beyond government regulation and fact checking, which are hugely important. Um, the strategies that we'll talk about today are not really counter strategies because I think counter sometimes implies responsive or reactive. 
Um, the strategies we'll be talking about are proactive, prospective, they look ahead, um, because we, we need something more than fact-checking. Fact-checking fact cannot um, handle this problem on its own because as, as Mark Twain once said, um, a lie travels uh, halfway around the world before truth gets its trousers on. Um, so uh, we need to be thinking more about proactive strategies like inoculation and vaccination. So um, John, Sondra, I, I wanna start with you because you've written so extensively on this topic. Uh, can you brief us here a little bit um, what have we learned about um, conceptualizing disinformation as a virus? So I think I think it will be good if I uh, sort of start and then Sandra and, and Melissa as well, please feel free to interrupt at any time and sort of add things here and there. But the idea is I think uh, we will discuss a little bit the idea of what the psychological inoculation is and then go a little bit into the work that we've been doing uh, together with Drosso, Ruyut and Rivka um, on developing these kinds of inoculation interventions and also um, how we tested them. So what I want to be talking about a little bit is our um, work on psychological inoculations and the interesting metaphor that we can use here, defense against the dark arts, if you will. So as, uh, as Rory said, getting at this talk, uh, a proactive rather than a reactive approach. But how do you do that? And there's, of course, many ways to do it, but what we're focusing on is doing this at the level of, you know, the individual of, of, psycho of psychology, essentially. And um, the approach that we uh, um, employ to build what you might call psychological resistance against future deception attempts is called inoculation theory. And the idea is quite old from the 1960s, but essentially it says you can, by exposing people to a weakened version of a particular argument uh, induce uh, a level of psychological resistance uh, against the, well, against future deception attempts in a way. And um, one of the innovations that we, uh, well, are not completely responsible for, of course, um, but that we've championed, I guess is a reasonable way to put it, is to not focus on individual uh, deceptive or manipulative arguments, but rather to see if we can build what you might call a broad spectrum vaccine against um, manipulation and by focusing on the techniques that are used to uh, mislead people rather than each individual example of fake news. So the, the first project, I guess, of any significance that we undertook in this direction is a, a game called Bad News. And uh, I think everyone in this talk at the moment uh, has a significant, can stake out a significant claim to uh, what this has become. And um, the idea behind bad news is, well, okay, why not make fake news a bit fun, right? Make it a bit naughty, if you will. And we were a bit inspired by the success of video games like Red Dead Redemption and, uh, and Grand Theft Auto, which uh, allow you to play as the bad guy. In fact, encourage playing as the bad guy, which seems to tap into, you know, people's, um, well, funny bones, I guess. Um, and the idea was, well, there's a lot of materials out there, many of which haven't really been properly experimentally tested, that explain how misinformation works or disinformation works. But all of it is either pretty boring because it's a lot of reading or it's very much a goody two shoes approach, which means you'll most likely read some people, sure, but maybe not the people that might benefit the most from an intervention like this. And uh, that's why we thought, well, why not let you play as the fake news creator in the game? So bad news is very simple. It's basically point and click, essentially. And your goal is to become famous as a fake news creator. Uh, as you can see here in the slide, you can see the followers um, that you're building for your fake news empire and the credibility, which in this meter is uh, in this screenshot is quite low still, but has to go all the way up to max uh, if you want to be as successful as you can with your fake news empire. And uh, one of the things that you can do in the game is uh, impersonate the president of the United States. As you can see, the, it's misspelled, but as the game shows, even a, a badly impersonated Donald Trump can still um, surprise some people. So um, 
we thought that that would be a fun thing to include to make clear the concept that people aren't always with this team and it's really easy to actually just create a fake account online and start impersonating people or organizations and then do damage that way but the game teaches a lot more techniques like how does a conspiracy theory work for example how do you use emotional language um, as a persuasion tool how do you uh, drive groups in society apart, like increasing intergroup polarization and so on and so on. And um, one of the nice things is that we uh, well, work as scientists to, to experimentally test how this kind of intervention actually works. And um, this is a, a figure from uh, Melissa's paper from January, I think this year, please correct me if I'm wrong, where we tested um, the effectiveness of the bad news game against the control group. So the control group played Tetris and the treatment group, the inoculation group this figure played bad news. And then what you see among other things is um, people find um, social media posts that we show them that contain misinformation, a lot less reliable after playing bad news compared to the control group. And this is a, an experimental result that we find very consistently um, and that we've since verified when it comes to people's confidence to, uh, in their ability to spot misinformation. Also, uh, their sharing behavior, at least intentions to share uh, misinformation with others, is reduced after playing the game. Um, and well, there's a lot of details that we can go into, but we don't really need to do that now. Uh, but essentially, we keep throwing different methods of investigation at this game to see if we're actually tapping into a real effect or if it's... Uh, you know, a coincidental result in some way, and we basically keep finding the same thing, which is it definitely seems to work as a way to reduce the perceived reliability of misinformation, at least. And also, these effects last quite long, up to 13 weeks with with booster shots. So that's quite nice. Um, we've also applied this approach in other contexts. So the bad news game is very much about misinformation, very generally. Um, but we also applied it to extremism. So how, what techniques, persuasion techniques are used by people to um, convince young people, let's say, to join an extremist organization um, with good results currently translating this into Arabic with the hope of um, testing the game that we developed for this called Radicalize in uh, Arabic speaking countries, specifically in refugee camps in uh, Lebanon. Um, another thing is uh, a project that is currently ongoing with the Center for Advanced Hindsight at uh, Duke University, which is the Dan Ariely's lab, um, is vaccine misinformation. So can you clarify, let's say, what techniques are used to dissuade people from getting vaccinated? Uh, at least, you know, there are good reasons not to get vaccinated. For example, you have an autoimmune disease, fair enough. But if you think it gives you autism, then not fair enough, because that's not true, right? So how do you distinguish between you know legitimate persuasion strategies and misinformation and how do you clarify this uh, through a game in this case so that's hopefully about to be tested uh, very soon um, and another one is uh, political misinformation so uh, for that we built what you might call bad news 2.0 called harmony square where you are hired as uh, the chief disinformation officer for some unnamed organization and um you your goal is to destroy harmony square and harmony square is a very peaceful place uh, and you have to use all your you know wits and strategies to make sure that harmony square begins to hate itself um so that's sort of the the, the specific tactics that are used to, to spread misinformation about elections and increase uh, the distance between groups in a particular society for example and the final one uh, which i will defer to melissa for is uh, this project called Go Viral, which anyone who's interested can access at www.goviralgame.com, which is specifically about uh, misinformation about coronavirus. Um, and Melissa, if you will, um, please take it away, and I will I will keep sharing this uh, this screen so that everyone can see the things that we've been working on. Wonderful, thank you, John. Um, yes, yeah, so together with the cabinet office, we developed a five minute game on disinformation about COVID-19 specifically. Uh, the game is designed and kind of, I guess, um, following the, the steps of bad news and all, all the other projects that have led, have been led by Droh and our lab in collaboration. Um, Go Viral 
I guess, is a five minute choice based game where just as John just explained, you are invited to tap into the shoes of a media manipulator, drop all ethical pretenses and kind of learn the tactics that you have to use to make disinformation go viral. Um, by kind of selecting between strategically um, deceptive choices and and kind of more, um, I guess, innocent choices, you learn how which choices get you higher credibility scores, more likes, more engagement online, and what makes disinformation go viral in the in the first place. So the way it works is that in the game, you work your way through three levels, essentially, um, which are based on some of the most common strategies used in the spread of disinformation, especially uh, that we see in when it comes to COVID-19. Um, some of that includes misusing a fake expert or, you know, causing outrage through emotional language or building your own conspiracy theory um, and kind of letting that go viral and take its own take it uh, its, its own uh, toll in the world, I guess. Um, but it's designed in a non-judgmental way that is fun and hopefully engaging, where players can kind of take either way of uh, how the scenario evolves and how their conspiracy theory goes viral. We have, um, we're still waiting to do more intense research on it now. We have go viral, translated into French and German as well. But our initial pilot test data shows that it is more effective when compared to more, more uh, traditional, um, I guess, interventions to combat disinformation around the coronavirus. I, I can tell you, I can tell you already from um, my real time uh, uh, um, uh, anal uh, analytics app that we've had 200,000 people play the game of go viral in the past week. Behavior is actually the key to solving disinformation as a problem um, because the behavioral part is, is where things go viral and people interact with each other and get the belief systems of the others, etc. cetera. Um, whereas information is just, just, and that's what the fact checkers do. You have this, this piece of information and you put something else against it, but it doesn't do anything with behavior. Just generally with this gamification, you're fighting fire with fire. That is, if we understand social networks and digital platforms for social connection these days as um, delivery systems of dopamine, whether they're through likes, increasing your numbers of friends, it makes sense to have a platform or a response that also delivers um, the kind of social stimulus, that influx of dopamine. Um, yeah, great, what you're saying is true, right? Really. The, the fun thing is that 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 um, the, the bad news game actually sort of went viral without us. I mean, we we've never spent a single cent on advertising for the games, but it, I mean, uh, they 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 they're still played over a thousand times a day, which is amazing. And we've actually adapted bad news into uh, a game that can be can be played within the classroom, so in in high schools. Uh, and we we found that that actually really works because it's it's super funny and the students are, are really getting into it and and they play it uh, with the help of a, of a peer educator so that's someone their own age and they can really talk about the game and they can sort of pause it in between and talk about what's happening within the game what's happening with them personally and we find that that really works and that it actually allows the children to sort of think in a different way about disinformation. And the, and the really fun thing is that they can use their cell phone while doing it. So they can actually have their own, they have their own sort of, they're, 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 they team up with their cell phone and then you see on the big screen, you see all the teams on the screen. So they, they, they become their fake, fake account. And then you can see on the screen, the level of fake accounts, the high scores, and then they try to beat each other, which is really, really awesome. <laughs> it's really fun. <laughs> I am fascinated by this because it, it accords with um, something that we've been calling a, a pleasure principle with disinformation that's often left out of policy discussions. That is, disinformation works because it can call out to us. As I mentioned before, it kind of seduces us um, and gratifies in, in some way. It affirms our worldview. It allows us to feel exceptional, different. 
Um, yeah. I'm quite intrigued by that because I think within our own discipline, it's often referred to Freud's kind of yeah. psychotic theory of personality and, you know, regarded as the driving force that kind of seeks immediate gratification of all needs and urges and wants, etc. And I think it was in the was it the Netflix documentary that came out recently, The Social Dilemma, where they point out that, you know, there's a reason why the social media industry and the illegal drug industry are the only industries that refer to their customers as users and kind of emphasizing why it is so addictive. And I agree that there is a, you know, dopamine induced loop of instant gratification. And yes, sure, um, any interventions that kind of tap into the psychological mechanisms as to why these things are believed and shared uh, to begin with to heighten the vigilance when we are exposed to such forms of disinformation are important. But I also think it's important to note that it's not just the technology itself that is the problem. Yes, algorithms and filter bubbles reinforce and exploit cognitive vulnerabilities and our research tries to kind of fight against that, but we do I also do think that fundamentally the business model behind these social media networks is also part of a big problem. So it is important to emphasize that we do kind of need a multi-layer defense mechanism against it on a policy level, but also that the tech giants put their two cents in. I know that Twitter, for example, introduced, recently introduced little, I guess, uh, nudges or hurdles before you are able to retweet something. So it will say, hey, you haven't actually clicked on the article. Do you want to read it before you retweet? Or, hey, the stuff that you're retweeting has been marked as potentially uh, false. Do you want to double check or share anyway? So I do think that none of these interventions necessarily are a silver bullet to the problem and that we will need psychological and technological and policy related uh, kind of weapons against it. Yeah, I think that's a very important point in the sense that, you know, there are people making a lot of money off of sharing and, and letting fake content be shared and that the whole incentive structure is wrong um, of, uh, uh, of that media, media ecosystem on social media. And talking about that documentary, my favorite line was, um, when you're not paying for the product, you are the product. Um, right. and, and I think people forget that uh, they make money because we share content. Um, and, and that's really, you know, that's something that we should tackle both from the individual decision making perspective, but also from the perspective of those who are reaping the benefits of that behavior. I think if I may add one, one last thing to this, because I fully agree with what Sandra and Melissa just said. Um, but it's interesting to think about like what these algorithms that are behind what you were shown when you scroll through your Facebook wall, for example, uh, how they are designed. Like they use machine learning um, to basically optimize for attention it's because that's what you can sell to advertisers, right? Um, so the order in which you're shown posts, uh, the order in which you're shown like news articles and then an ad and then another news article and then a post about a puppy and all that, like that is subject to learning by a machine. And the machine keeps getting better at figuring out what grabs your attention. And unfortunately, that machine is learning or the algorithm is learning uh, human biases and cognitive failures, essentially. One of the things that we like is simply, you know, sensational content. We love it because that's what grabs our attention. And that means that after you show something that's completely outrageous, uh, like if after you're showing something outrageous, you show an ad you're more likely to pay attention to that ad, which is valuable to advertisers. And that's how you make more money if you are Facebook in this case. And that is like, you can only do so much about that as, as Sandra and Melissa just said, because basically the fundamental principle here is making money. And uh, you're not going to convince Facebook to, to give up its entire business model, right? To not use machine learning, for example, to optimize people's attention that they pay to ads. So, Unfortunately, um, there is definitely a possibility that this, an actual solution to the problems that we're identifying here involves measures that Facebook and Twitter and Google and so on absolutely hate. And then, well, okay, what do you do about that? It is also interesting to kind of engage in a thought experiment about a social network that isn't at all tarnished by profit making. And to imagine what that social network would look like, you'd still have mischievous actors out there seeking to deceive. Um, 
again, to have fun. And so having techniques uh, and, and tools and, and, and platforms like yours that um, allow people to have fun, but in a more constructive, positive way is, is important. And, and going back, um, Rivka and, and Ruud, to the work you're doing both online and offline, you mentioned your work with schools and with children. Older adult communities tend to be very vulnerable to disinformation. We, we did try to create a game for the, the, the elder, like, like uh, it's not the, really the elderly, I mean, um, like, like 50 plus. And um, we even had um, our... What was the age we again? Have a, <laughs> Careful 50 what you plus. say there. Uh, 50 yeah. plus. Like, 50 when, plus. I, I don't know if it, it, was, it was aimed at 50 plus, but we have a party called 50 plus in the Netherlands, a political party. And um, I, I spoke to their leader and, um, and asked him, like, would you like in on, on creating a game for your, uh, your voters just to, to, to um, well, to make them more savvy um, uh, in, in, on the matter of disinformation? And uh, he was really into that, but he, he got sacked a while ago. So we lost that connection, but um, it, it'd be interesting to, to work together with a group of, of, of your target audience in a way to, to understand them better and, and where I believe, I mean, the fun fact is that the game has been played a lot by older people as well, because it, 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 it sort of, it is easy. If you're a little bit tech savvy, you, you completely understand, but of course the, 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 the tone of voice and the, and the jokes are made for a younger audience in that sense. Right. Um, right. But it, it, it would be interesting to see how we could reach those people, uh, well, what, for instance, what what the 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 under pressure game, which is the, the 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 game for school classes, for instance, in Sweden is also used by an organization that goes to uh, uh, youth penitentiaries, uh, like uh, um, uh, where they go to youth prisons um, and uh, educate them there, which is also a place where normal education doesn't go. It's um, yeah, this is completely anecdotal, but at at one uh, Cambridge party uh some you know a, a retired fellow he must have been in his early 80s came up to me and said you know thanks for making the game uh at such a level that even i can understand what's going on in social media and i was like well i was probably wasn't responsible for that part but i'm really pleased to hear that you know you were still able to relate to uh to the game and i found that really encouraging that even people in their 70s and 80s still can understand more or less what's what's going on. Maybe, you know, for, for the distinguished plus 50 audience, um, a kind of who's done it detective perspective taking exercise might be more exciting than the GTA bad guy sort of uh, um, perspective. So, you know, and on the other hand, there, there's other questions about, you know, on average more males play the games than females. So how could we design materials that appeal to different target groups differently by tweaking, you know, variations of, of the game? I think that that's a really important uh, sort of question. But the research that John and I and the Winton Center here just released on COVID actually showed that older people were better at spotting COVID fake news uh, than younger people, which is quite interesting. And we think that maybe because in this case, older people are actually the ones most vulnerable uh, to COVID-19 and may, it may be more on the lookout uh, uh, than you know when it comes to political fake news. I think it's really important to also note that, you know, persuasion research shows that actually issue involvement and experience is a big factor as to whether we are resistant to that or not. And also kind of parallel to inoculation theory itself, it doesn't surprise me that those, that the elderly that are most vulnerable during this current pandemic have a heightened perception of threat and therefore hopefully feel motivated to, you know, research more and seek out more information and fact check everything. And it's kind of aligned with our research as well. What do you say to people who are convinced that by encouraging people to play as the bad guy, you're in fact encouraging the the problem you're seeking to to fight? I I, I always reply with with saying that I I have some friends who who do karate, but they don't go around kicking people in the streets. Um, you use it to defend yourself in case if ever, anyone tries to harm you. So you you understand the techniques of the game and and you you make sure you don't get fooled. And of course, a vaccine works in the same way that if we have herd immunity, um, uh, nobody could actually try those tricks, which are far more complex than you actually see in the, in the, in the, in the game if you want to try out yourself to become a, 
a, a fake news uh, mongerer. But um, yeah. Yeah, I think those two, the, you know, that element is pretty key that, you know, following the vaccination analogy, people are exposed to severely weakened doses in a controlled environment. It's not like we're actually teaching people how to spread misinformation. It's more that we're exposing people to weakened doses of these strategies so that people can familiarize themselves with them and become more immune to them uh, over time. I think, you know, the, there's a benefit to stepping into the shoes of somebody who's trying to deceive you in terms of really learning something. I tend to use the, the magic show metaphor that, you know, the traditional approach has been to give people the facts, you know, fact checking. And, you know, when you go see a magic show and you're duped the first time by the trick, there's one solution, which is to give you a blueprint of how the trick works and get very scientific and technical about it. But the other way is just to let people figure out the trick on their own. And I think as Rude was saying, you know, letting people figure out how a trick works doesn't mean people will go on to be a professional magician, right? And so uh, that's, that's just generally not how it works. Um, but I think on a more serious note, what we've tried to do is, is um, you know, the reasons for why people spread fake news tends to be either financial or for political reasons. And, you know, we're not teaching people anything about how to make money off of fake news in the game, and it's not political either. So we've tried to rule out the incentives um, that lead people to spread fake news, and those incentives are not featured as part of the game to try to minimize any of that risk. You've invested a lot of effort in making these games available in different languages from Romanian to Russian to German to Ukrainian. What, what have you uh, learned from these different uh, linguistic versions so far? We did publish one study at the beginning of this year where we tested bad news in four different languages that aren't English, Swedish, German, Polish, and Greek. Um, and we basically found the same results across the board, pretty much, meaning with the sim very similar effect sizes. So the learning effect seems to be about the same, uh, minor differences, but nothing much. But one thing that I did think was interesting was um, we basically asked people to rate the reliability of particular headlines uh, before they played a game and then after, and then we measure the differences between before and after. That's one of the ways in which we measure effectiveness. Um, and we do find, weirdly enough, that there are um, differences between countries for who is initially more susceptible to misinformation. So in the United States and the United Kingdom, for example, and in most countries, we find that people who identify as right-wing rate misinformation as more reliable than people who are left-wing before playing, and then they have the same learning effect, right? So they, they learn equally well, and they're both equally interested, it seems to be. But there is a difference in initial uh, reliability ratings. But in Poland, it's the reverse. So there's that. There are people who are left-wing are more susceptible initially or to rate misinformation as more reliable. Um, so that's, a, that's an interesting finding that we don't really know how to explain all that well. Well, in terms of uh, the translations of the game that we've done thus far, it's, uh, what, what we see is that it depends mostly on the quality of, of the translation itself. So we do see a lot of difference uh, within the quality there. Uh, because uh, wherever it's been translated and localized a lot, it seems to have like better reactions. I mean, of course, as, as all the examples that are uh, within the game apply more to yourself and your own personal context, and of course, it's a lot more um, um, convincing, so to say. Here, I hope we can show the Ukrainian version of the game, uh, because as a country actively engage in an armed conflict with Russia, Ukraine has often been the, the first stop, the, the, the crucible or, or laboratory of, of Kremlin disinformation tactics, of, of a lot of disinformation tactics. Um, I hosted a, a conference years ago in 2014 um, called Ukraine and the Global Information War, and our Ukrainian colleagues um, from Stop Fake, uh, from Hromadske International, warned people here in the UK about the dangers of fake news. Um, and there were a lot of raised eyebrows in the audience, a lot of kind of smirks, knowing smirks that this kind of problem wouldn't happen here. So the kind of exceptionalism that American and British audiences have taken to the problem of fake news that our Ukrainian uh, colleagues and um, friends have had to deal with now for a very long time um, was something of an obstacle. The fact that this information happened to Ukraine uh, in, in 2014, um, mainly the, the, with, the, with, with the Maidan protests and the Russian disinformation, 
is 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 basically the reason that we're all sitting here today because um that for Jan and me that was that was the reason to actually start understanding the problem um and and eventually setting up draw because we created a game that was too popular to just sit back and relax yeah so that's that's the whole reason we're here so far all of our results and i think there's an important caveat all of our results pertain to you know either western democracies or uh countries where there's where there are free elections and and, and freedom of press and so we haven't really tested a lot of these interventions in, in other parts of the world with with different media regimes so that might be something interesting i i I've talked about bad news in Palestine, which was kind of a weird because you have the 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 the, the, the translation uh, simultaneously, and I didn't know if all my puns really reached the audience. But um, I I I I do <laughs> I do believe that um, there are regions where 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 life is so different from indeed our our Western European lives um, that 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 the inoculation that the localization in, in that sense really needs some uh, additional uh, uh, attention. Sander, Melissa and I worked on a project with uh, WhatsApp and they basically asked us if we could design a game in the same vein as Bad News, um, but specifically that uh, a game that specifically looks at misinformation that spreads on direct messaging apps, which takes on slightly different forms and isn't so much a problem here, although it has been during coronavirus a little bit, um, but is a huge problem in countries like India, Mexico and Brazil. Um, and we did this and we tested this intervention in the UK and we got really good results, like amazing, uh, amazing stats. It was great, uh, believe me. Um, but then we also collaborated with the, um, well, with an Indian organization and uh, they helped us translate the game and also basically reconceptualize it uh, into Hindi. And we also did a, a study in, in India among uh, not necessarily people from Delhi, but especially, uh, especially people from outside of uh, the cities and urban areas, uh, because we wanted to see what can this type of intervention also be useful for people who don't really use computers every day, but do have a smartphone that they use. And they helped us a lot with that, and that was really nice. But the thing that we basically found was uh, it didn't really work because our, our theory is that the people who were in that study uh, were not really used to playing online games uh, on iPads or on their phone or whatever. So they had essentially two mountains to climb instead of one. The first mountain being learning how to play a game and the second mountain being learning the lessons that the game conveys. Um, so that also means that you, as, as Ryud says, you have to be very careful um, assuming that what you're doing here is going to be useful everywhere because although people's brains basically work the same way everywhere um, that kind of ignores the fact that people might have very different experiences uh, in different parts of the world that mean that your oh, concept yeah. of what works doesn't always work everywhere but we we did a we did a good job at, at creating something for Jordan summer schools actually where we where we created a sort of offline version of the game um, together with uh, UNESCO I believe um, where actually the 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 the, the all those school children really liked polarizing, for instance. But then, based on it, it, do you brush your teeth or do you use a stick, which is apparently something in Jordan that's 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 like a fifty-fifty divide in the population. Um, and and using those examples in a, in an offline environment where we could actually achieve the same. Well, we haven't tested it, so it would be an interesting thing to 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 get some some scientific results on that as well. Yeah, I think the context really matters here in that uh, in India, you know, we're talking about rural India, literacy levels were extremely low. Um, and the partner organization that we worked with, I mean, they had a different philosophy. So I'm also not, not sure to what extent they were able to convey the c context in which this intervention occurs, but it seemed that for you know, individuals who are not used to thinking about media in this way, and so even go to the level of, of having some sort of irony about stepping into the shoes of somebody who's trying to deceive you, it just wasn't um, perhaps not resonating in the same ways that they're used to digesting media messages. Um, and so it's really interesting. We also did a test in Burundi in Africa, 
which which didn't go as planned uh, again because not not as the interpretation, but more in terms of the recruitment of of of, of the, the the idea of combining research and gaming. Um, and so, and and get, you know, getting people to play it on the iPad and kind of understanding what's it what it's what it's about. And so, I think it's a really interesting challenge. You know, and Ruud mentioned, you know, he did something offline there, and maybe that maybe that people understand that better, you know, in that context. Um, and so, I think there there are a lot of interesting things that we could do to try to adapt it to different uh, cultural contexts uh, in terms of how people best learn about these topics. I think there's a fascinating, even for those, you know, academic colleagues who are invested in translation studies, there's a treasure trove of information here about, as you say, localizing these types of games, contextualizing them. Um, it's fascinating. Can you give people a, a sense of how many users we're talking about here? I mean, maybe just a few examples. For instance, the German one has been played 50,000 times in the past year. I, I think there's a there's a that's just it, it's just a, there's a disinformation market there's a demand that is there's a supply, and in that sense the demand is very high so there's big supply and that's what we're dealing with and we can't change that from the perspective of journalism I mean it's not a balance it's not if we have more journalism then we have less disinformation, and the way that we're targeting disinformation nowadays through policy makers is is often, um, yeah uh, it, it 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 doesn't help in a sense that i mean indeed like learning to become more resilient becoming more resilient is a better effect than learning that something was or true or false or whatever um and labeling which is mostly done nowadays by twitter and facebook like saying this is this is uh labeled as disinformation so we won't spread it as much but and you can't maybe you can't retweet it but you can still quote it etc like um well, well the, the other stuff that we're doing right now is basically trying to look at all those different sectors and trying anyone hears the baby or is it just me <laughs> the, the the stuff that we're doing right now is basically look, looking at those different sectors and trying to find solutions so the the awareness resilience part is is covered by the games and and we can still move on like and into non-game areas which i think using active inoculation in different settings is, is really appealing to us. Um, what we're doing also is trying to look at the policy making uh, sector where we actually try to give them uh, um, sort of things to hold on to when they're designing policy because nowadays everybody is saying like this information is wrong but it's a matter of, of press freedom or freedom of speech so we can't really do anything about it. But at the same time, you can define all those different tactics used uh, and specifically uh, technical tactics. So uh, automated account creation, for instance, is something you can define. And if we can sort of define the phenomena, we can actually make a system out of that. And, and, and based upon those phenomena, we can, we can create policy. Like we can say it's, it's not allowed to use automated account creation in such a way, or it's not a, allowed to use bot networks in such a way that, that, that it's not used by a company that's, that's, that has a, a, as an, a, a service where you, can, where you can reach them and the bot replies. No, it's, 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 it's bot creation in a way that we can steer tens of thousands of, of, of non-real people. Um, so basically setting up a sort of ISO standardization for the, the, the tactics of, of this information. And, um, and another thing that we're doing right now, and, and it's where all the election, um, um, all, all the attention during elections is going to is, is like, is there, is there interference on, on changing the outcome of the elections? And, and the main result is that everybody wants to fact check everything that's being said where we want to do a sort of meta fact check. <laughs> what we want to go is that, that the next level of fact checking is not checking the contents of an article, but checking the behavior that, uh, fact checking the behavior that, that, that made the article get online or, 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 or go viral. Uh, so basically that we can actually identify patient zero from, uh, from, for instance, a message on social media that went viral and then journalists started covering it because apparently everybody was talking about it. And if we can say already, like, this, uh, this message was posted by a fake account uh, uh, for the first time it, it reached the internet, um, we can already state that 
then we don't need to check the information because we already know that it's it originated from a fake account. So if we can actually, we call it forensic journalism, basically try to be the detective and finding out um, the, 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 the patterns actually in the distribution of information so that we can say, we can see a pattern of coordinated inauthentic behavior and therefore we don't need to check this information but we can actually sort of ignore it. Maybe we can conclude with one thing that I think we'll all agree on and that is what um, Timothy Snyder in his terrific book on tyranny calls minor choices that we can all make and a lot of them are um, very simple that is to get off uh, our digital platforms read books um, make small talk with strangers talk to people we don't always agree with um, these are the kinds of things that hopefully keep developing and uh, cultivating our uh, ecumenical political perspectives and, and our discourse so we'll, we'll leave it there uh, I'm Rory Finnan. It's been an honor to be speaking um, with Sander van der Linden, uh, Ruud Oosterwood, uh, Melissa Bossel, John Rosenbeek, Rivka Otten. Um, we're going to be leaving links to, uh, to all their work, to all their organizations, to the games. Um, so be sure to check them out.